Good morning. How are you? Well, I've been uh, traveling to Owl's Head, Maine, which is where I am now, and I'm down by the water. The temperature today is 65, and that's about the high it's going to be. Uh, yesterday, it was uh, 81 degrees, so it was a big hop downward. And it's kind of welcome after the heat in Virginia. There's a much more calm feeling about a place, it seems to me, anywhere near the water. I've always thought since I was a kid that uh, if you could be near the water and that kind of rhythm of the wind and the waves and the smell of the salt, that uh, you're in a special place. And so this is a, a great retreat. And uh, because I don't really like driving, we drove extended periods to get up to Owl's Head from Northern Virginia. And uh, so I haven't had a chance to comment on some of the things that are going on. One of them is the uh, Fifth Circuit decision, which I've only started to read. And at the heart of it, you have two states represented by the attorney generals complaining that the government is discouraging false statements about covid and the vaccination associated with it. And then there are a bunch of activists who also are complaining about it. And here's the thing. The notion that free press encompasses any word that can come into your small head should be repeated and said aloud is, in my opinion, constrained by the responsibility not to by exercising this extraordinary, overbroad right, compromise the health and well-being of other people. So if you needed a rule of thumb understanding of what's at stake, it would be consider speech plus conduct. Okay, so if my speech is whatever you do, don't take the vaccination, sort of like an RFK Jr. thing, and you're kind of an established website that people rely on and, and think as reliable and follow, you're compromising their health and well-being by having this statement out there. Now, I haven't read the opinion, but the pr principle is that you may not, as a government, discourage false and misleading claims about a pandemic and or the remedies to it that you have to allow into the discussion the dumbest, stupidest, anti-scientific domination of free will to do anything and say anything no matter the effects on other people. Okay, so is that an overstatement? I don't think so. And what it does is, repeatedly since 2016, we could take ourselves to 1984 and read chapters there, the Ministry of Truth, which is really about untruth, and trying to eliminate certain words from the vocabulary so that people don't have a means of expression by a word. The theory in 1984 is they don't have that word, they can't have that thought. And we have a lot of that, and it's infected, in my opinion, the Fifth Circuit. Because while perhaps one can go too far saying to somebody, stop this nonsense, you're killing people, uh, and I don't know what, what, that, what that length and breadth is, but I do think you have a right and a responsibility as a government to warn and pester people who are talking scientific nonsense or non-scientific babble, however you want to put it. So that's one of the things out there. And I think it's unfortunate that we have to have a fight like this. And the First Amendment, ironically, was meant to have the free expression of views not the free expression of lies. And that's always been the problem because 
an open society, a democratic society, presents an opportunity to, well, undermine a system of such freedom because of the freedom. So there's that. And I will read the opinion and I'll correct as necessary. But uh, And I am looking forward to reading it because I want to see what their, quote, reasoning, close quote, is. I assume it'll be appealed, but with the Supreme Court of corrupt right-wing minds, I don't expect the fair expression by the court of this matter, but I'm hopeful. We'll see. The Supreme Court, even in terrible times, has been in the right place on the First Amendment, but this is an alleged constraint on social media and elsewhere by the government saying, no, you shouldn't do that. What are you saying that for? And uh, so... Must the government and its expertise remain mute in the face of possible health claims, illness, death? And I think, no, I don't think so. Uh, Now, what else is going on? Well, we're getting out of Georgia a statement that various people, other people, were not indicted. And I'm tired of the naysayers attacking what I consider good news when we learn that we are identifying and a grand jury in Georgia did identify the bad actors involved in the attempted overthrow of the government in the Georgia version. And among those that we find out were mentioned was no less than Lindsey Graham. And Lindsey Graham went into the state And he claimed he just went there because he was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He has to be aware of these things. So all of a sudden he became staff and so forth. And apparently his conversations were, uh, why don't you loosen up and, you know, deal with this question involving Trump? Anyhow, we'll know more about that in the days ahead. Uh, Now, should he have been prosecuted? Some say, well, they, they probably didn't have the evidence against him. Well, there's another theory, which is, the apples and oranges of having Lindsey Graham in the same case with Trump may not make sense since what Lindsey did is as an adjunct and the presentation should as a narrative be understandable and straightforward and Lindsey Graham may present uh, a different kind of offense that doesn't fit RICO as neatly as those who were charged. So it's not, I don't think it's a question of sufficient evidence. I think it's a question of the aptness of naming Lindsay. Now, many years ago, when I was on the Hill, and I was running investigations for the House Labor Committee, I had been down in uh, the Carolinas, and I was flying back to the Capitol, and Lindsey Graham was on the plane. And because of delays and so forth, we had a long conversation and we discussed basically uh, what was imminent, which then was going to be the impeachment of uh, Clinton, although we didn't know when at that time. We just knew it was coming. And Lindsay told me he was recruited to join the Judiciary Committee to be a part of that because of his former experience as a prosecutor. And he told me, his whole life was bound up in public service. That's, that's what he existed for, and that's what he was going to do. And it's interesting that over a span of time, you get to see how that unfolds. And in his case, he attached himself like a uh, small caboose to various prominent political figures, McCain included, and then Trump who was kind of the anti-McCain, and he became whatever seemed necessary to help advance him in the political stratosphere. And unlike the other people who managed the impeachment, he succeeded where they failed. That is to say, the Clintons set out to end the political careers of those who had voted against them And Lindsay was one of the survivors. There was one other, and I don't remember who that was. So 
Uh, I think that that disclosure is a good one. It shows, that is, that the Georgia investigative grand jury was looking at these other people and decided to write a narrative that included those most germane to an understandable discussion of what happened in Georgia. We are at a stage in these proceedings where we can see the fist landing and all of a sudden there's pain. There's pain in the sense of psychic, psychological. There's pain in the sense that the walls are closing in and that there doesn't appear to be a Hail Mary pass that's going to get people out of this. And the best example of that probably is the denial this past week by the court of the motion by Meadows to have his case removed to the federal court. And it was obvious from the beginning that what he was doing did not fit his official position as chief of staff, being out in the field, basically working on the campaign. And normally what you see is top staffers and chiefs of staff and others taking a leave of absence from the White House to do exactly what Meadows was doing while still chief of staff. And then there is also the fact that what he was doing was illegal, trying to change the outcome of an election that was not flawed factually and there was no legal theory by which to accomplish what Trump said in that perfect phone call and what Meadows contributed to that discussion. So you you get a sense of how these guys are the end justifies the means, however corrupt in every case. So that was another punch in the face to those who were looking for an easy way out. What Meadows hoped was that his case, damn the others, his case, would be moved to federal court one way or other, and then he could make a motion to dismiss him as a, uh, we've got bikes passing me here. Whoa. Okay. There's no dirt road here. <laughs> I wonder how they do on a dirt road back my way. So he hoped to come into the case and uh, then he would move for a immunity to dismiss the case, saying because of his position, he should not be prosecuted at all. Well, that's all crashed and burned. And Trump, they wonder, why is he waiting? Well, he's waiting to spend the most time delaying to hopefully confound the game. And he has 30 days after waiving his arraignment on the day of his arraignment. And so that's approaching. So he wanted that 30 days to run. Also, he and his lawyer logically figured they would see what happened to Meadows, and what happened to Meadows was, nah, forget it, fella, not going to happen. So, and the court has also denied the severance requested by Powell and by Cheese bro, Shea bro, Ches bro, choose, take your choice. He's used all three voices. So, uh, well, that was a fast turnaround, gang. <laughs> so, the, uh, so what kind of signals are we getting? The signals we're getting are all positive in the sense that it's like the authority of the land against wrongdoers and the policies of how and where to try cases is prevailing. And as I talk to you today from this cooler climb up in Maine, the, uh, the court in Georgia has a trial date set for October the 23rd. So that's, that's pretty interesting. We'll see how that's navigated. And then in D.C., we have a trial 
uh, for March of 2024. So that should keep Trump out of trouble if it goes forward. And for all those people out there saying, oh my God, how can you try it? Why can't you try the case? You wrote the story, you tell the story, you have the witnesses, you line them up in as logical an order as possible, you permit them to have notes, and you use a bigger courtroom, you get a court reporter, and you launch. This is not, there have been large trials in the past. Why shouldn't this be a large trial? It's about nothing less than the overthrow of our government. So, uh, I uh, say, uh, I tip my hat to you from from Maine, and I'm walking toward uh, a lighthouse here, which is part of my uh, daily ministrations when I'm up here. I came out last night and walked by the water in the dark, and the sky was so dark. It was fabulous, and you could just see the stars as clear as bell. And there were some boats near the harbor where I walked at the beginning of this talk. And, uh, oh, it's marvelous. It, the You need changes like this to keep you fresh. So I say uh, good morning to you from Maine. I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.